Good afternoon and welcome to the second TransformTO webinar. My name is Stuart Dudfield and I will be the webinar facilitator for this morning. Today's webinar will include a 30-minute presentation followed by a question and answer period for the participants. City of Toronto and the Atmospheric Fund staff will respond to as many questions and comments as time permits during the webinar. The webinar recording will be available online on the TransformTO webpage following the first following this webinar. Transform TO Report 2 is also now available on toronto.ca forward slash transform TO. You are welcome to submit your comments or questions through the Q&A function to all participants on the WebEx. You can find this on the bottom of the right-hand corner of your screen or by tweeting at LiveGreenTO or at Atmospheric Fund with the hashtag transform TO. Again, transform TO. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties with the webinar, please email webcon at toronto.ca. Again, webcon at toronto.ca or submit a comment through the WebEx comment function. Today's webinar will include an overview of the transform TO project as well as key findings, recommendations, and action areas that are included in the Transform TO report number two. That will be going to the Parks and Environment Committee on May 4th. For more information about the report, please visit our website at toronto.ca forward slash transform TO. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Linda Swanson, Transform TO Project Lead at the City of Toronto. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Stuart. So just to reiterate, as Stuart mentioned, in the presentation this afternoon, we'll begin with an overview of the process that has brought us to where we are today with the report going to the Parks and Environment Committee this Thursday, May 4th. We'll then identify some of the key findings from both the technical modeling that we undertook as part of this project, the community engagement, as well as the findings of our stakeholder advisory group. From those findings, I'll provide an overview of the recommendations presented in the staff report. And within those recommendations, an overview of the action areas that are recommended in the report to move us towards our long-term low-carbon goals. I'll conclude with a summary again of the work to date and the project recommendations and findings, as well as providing an overview of next steps. The question and answer period, which will last until 1.30 this afternoon, is an opportunity for any technical questions or questions about the process we've undertaken to provide further clarification on the recommendations in the staff report, the contents of our technical consultant's report, which is attachment B to the staff report, the summary findings of our modeling advisory group, attachment A to the staff report, or the third attachment, attachment C, which provides detailed responses to specific questions that were put to us through the Parks and Environment Committee last year in 2016. We hope that as many people as possible will provide their questions through the WebEx function as Stuart outlined. You can send your questions to all panelists through the WebEx platform in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and the Transform TO project team staff will do our best to respond. We will also be creating a frequently asked questions document, which will be posted to the Transform TO webpage after the webinar, which will capture some of the questions and answers that are provided today. Transform TO is a collaborative project between the City of Toronto, the Atmospheric Fund, and numerous stakeholders from across the sectors who have been involved in both helping to initiate, develop, and advance the project, and will also have critical roles to play in the implementation of the project going forward. Transform TO is 
supported both by the Atmospheric Fund and also the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who provided project funding through the Green Municipal Fund. In front of you, you can see a timeline which provides an overview of the Transform TO project so far. Transform TO was initiated in May 2015 when Council endorsed a project terms of reference. Transform TO was also supported through the Subcommittee on Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation, which was formed as a subcommittee of the Parks and Environment Committee also in spring 2015. From there, the project kicked off into the phase one of community engagement. We took our first report to Parks and Environment Committee and to City Council in December 2016, which presented a package of immediate actions and short-term strategies. And as previously mentioned, we'll be bringing report two, the long-term strategies, to Parks and Environment Committee this Thursday, May 4th. The Transform TO project set out to answer two key questions. What combination of low carbon actions will put Toronto on the needed trajectory to reach our long-term low carbon target of an 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction by the year 2050 from a 1990 baseline? In addition, which low carbon actions have the most potential to drive and deliver community benefit? In answering these questions, we came across a number of key findings. A preliminary finding is that collaboration is absolutely essential. Through the process of this project, we've talked to over 2,000 residents. We've involved staff from across the City of Toronto from multiple divisions. A modeling advisory group of 35 members, including representation from the economic sector, the public health sector, as well as social equity and community groups. And we've engaged in the project with a consortia of technical facilitation and modeling specialists. And as I mentioned before, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has provided $175,000 in grant funding to support the project development so far. In front of you, you can see a graph which depicts both the recorded emissions in Toronto as well as a business as planned scenario. As part of our technical modeling, we undertook a scenario to better understand, based on all of the plans and commitments that the City of Toronto has already made, what are the anticipated greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2050? So when you look at this slide, the red line at the top left-hand area of the graph represents recorded emissions. As that line becomes dashed or dotted, that represents the business as planned scenario. So you can see that while this projected emissions trajectory is decreasing based on the strong work that the city has already done around the official plan policies, around building energy efficiency retrofitting, and other programs around transit and active transportation infrastructure, there's still a significant gap between where we're projected to be in the year 2050 and our low carbon target. That gap is 8.7 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. If the gap is the challenge before us, we also can see that we have been very successful in terms of putting ourselves onto the track to exceed our 2020 target of a 30% greenhouse gas emission reduction by the year 2020. And it's that same kind of leadership and innovation and policy direction which has enabled us to exceed or project to exceed our 2020 target that will need to be built upon and accelerated to put us on track for the year 2050. Within the technical scenario modeling, in addition to the business as planned scenario, our technical consultant, Sustainability Solutions Group, also produced a low carbon scenario. The purpose of the low carbon scenario was to identify whether or not it was possible and what kinds of strategies would enable us to reach that low carbon target. 
What we found is that it will be possible for Toronto to reach the low carbon target with existing technologies. However, the pace and scale of implementation of these technologies will need to be increased. By looking at the different urban systems, our technical modeling low carbon scenario was able to identify significant areas of opportunity for greenhouse gas emission reduction. The key areas with the greatest potential for emission reduction potential include measures to support improved building energy efficiency, the electrification of transit, in the electrification of transportation, including personal vehicles, public transit, as well as the electrification of small vehicles like bicycles and bringing around electrification or hybrid vehicles for the freight sector presents a significant area of reductions opportunity as well. Community energy in the form of low carbon district energy or thermal energy networks along with community energy planning also present a significant area of emission reduction opportunity. And finally, increased waste diversion and active transportation and transit infrastructure are a critical part of putting us on track to hit the low carbon 2050 target and close the gap. In addition to identifying that it is possible to reach our low carbon 2050 target, our process also identified that low carbon actions have the potential to create valuable community benefits. We see significant increases in public health and community resilience when programs are designed with those outcomes in mind. There's also the opportunity for major energy cost savings for residents in terms of the amount of money spent per month on energy, electricity, and heating. There's the opportunity for higher productivity, innovation, and competitiveness as this transformation of our urban systems creates jobs and opportunities for investment. And finally, a low carbon city involves more transportation options and greater accessibility of transportation for residents across the city. One of the pieces of the low carbon scenario technical modeling analysis included a geospatial analysis to help us understand not only the overall community-wide impacts of different interventions, both for carbon and for community benefit, but also to be able to look across the map of our city and see how different neighborhoods and communities were impacted by the proposed measures or the evaluated measures and strategies. While it is possible to reach the low carbon target and community benefits can be derived, we know that we will need to invest significantly to achieve these kinds of changes. Most of these investments, however, will see returns. Many reductions, many actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions have the potential to save money over the lifetime of the investment. Within the technical modeling, we saw that up to two-thirds of strategies modeled have a positive payback or a positive return in investment to the year 2050. Many of those positive returns were achieved through avoided capital costs, reduced maintenance costs, energy savings, and also avoided cost of carbon through new carbon pricing mechanisms. These investments tend to be front-end loaded, meaning that the initial investment may be significant while the returns are realized over a longer time period. Key recommendations. The staff report being presented to Parks and Environment Committee this Thursday proposes a set of long-term low-carbon goals. Those long-term low-carbon goals include that 100% of new buildings should be constructed to near zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. That all existing buildings where technically feasible need to be retrofitted to achieve deep energy efficiency savings by the year 2050. In our technical model, those savings average 40% of energy load. We're proposing that 30% of total floor space across the city be connected to low carbon thermal energy for heating and cooling by the year 2050. We're proposing that 75% of trips under five kilometers in length be walked or biked by the year 2050. An interim target for the year 2030 of 65% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions has been proposed. 75% of the energy that is used across the City of Toronto by the year 2050 is proposed, a proposed goal of that coming from renewable or low carbon sources. 
while 100% of our transportation using low or zero carbon energy by 2050, virtually eliminating fossil fuels. And finally, a proposed long-term long -term low carbon goal is the 95% waste diversion rate in all sectors by the year 2050. Those low carbon goals are all based upon what was modeled as part of the low carbon scenario in the Transform Trail report and are demonstrably achievable with existing technologies in the timeframes proposed. To achieve these community-wide goals, the staff report also proposes that the City of Toronto seek to lead by example, and this set of low-carbon leadership targets are also proposed within the staff report, that all new city-owned facilities be constructed to near zero GHG emissions by the year 2026, that all city-owned buildings are retrofitted to achieve deep energy savings by the year 2040, the 24 megawatts of renewable energy capacity be installed on city-owned facilities and lands by the year 2020. That the city-owned fleet transition to low carbon, 45% of city-owned fleet transition to low carbon vehicles by the year 2030. And that net zero waste designation is achieved at city-owned facilities by the year 2030 that 1.5 gigajoules of energy from biogas be generated at city facilities by the year 2030, and finally, that the City of Toronto be designated as one of Canada's top 100 green employers by the year 2020. In addition to setting community-wide long-term low-carbon goals and low-carbon leadership goals for city operations, the staff report also recommends shifting to a multi-benefit approach. While our analysis and recommendations from our Transform to Modeling Advisory Group determined that community benefit is certainly achievable through the implementation of low carbon actions, those low carbon actions and programs need to be designed with community benefit in mind. And so a set of guiding principles have been proposed in the staff report. All low carbon action advanced through the Transform to process should seek to advance social equity, improve affordability, particularly for vulnerable populations, contribute to poverty reduction and protect low-income residents while enhancing and strengthening the local economy. Low-carbon action should seek to maintain and create good quality local jobs, improve public health, and create resilient communities and infrastructure. To see how progress towards these transform TO goals and principles is progressing. The report also proposes a regular reporting schedule where updates on the transform TOT performance indicators are provided every two years. And in the first year of each new term of council, so every four years, an, a progress report is presented that identifies the key performance indicators, progress towards the City of Toronto low carbon leadership goals, and also provides revisions or additions to the implementation plan for that term of council. I'd like to remind everyone that at any time you can enter your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And at the end of this presentation, in approximately 10 to 15 minutes, the team will do our best to answer them. So please feel free to submit your questions now. And with that, I'll move us forward into the action areas proposed in the Transform TO report. The next section of the report will present an overview of five action areas that are advanced throughout the Transform to staff report and supported by the technical modeling and community engagement that's been undertaken to date. Within each action area, Transform to has identified a three-prong approach. The first element of the approach is to implement long-term, the approved long-term low carbon actions that the city has already adopted, you know, such as the long-term waste strategy, the official plan, the 10-year cycle plan update, et cetera. 
In addition to implementing what City Council has already confirmed and approved, the approach recognizes the need to pick up the pace by implementing the package of short-term strategies that were approved by City Council in Report 1 in December of 2016. In addition, there are accelerated actions and three acceleration campaigns that are proposed in this Report 2 of the Transform TO project. Just as cities are critical to achieving provincial and federal low carbon goals, neighborhoods are essential to creating and implementing municipal low carbon solutions. In terms of following through on planned actions, the Transform TO low carbon scenario has identified that the majority of growth in Toronto is happening in areas identified for growth in the official plan, and that this growth already seeks to support vibrant neighborhoods in complete communities. Similarly, the city-wide rapid transit network that is already planned must be implemented to reach our low carbon goal and is incorporated into the business's plan scenario and the emission reductions that are represented there. In December 2016, City Council approved two actions focused on neighborhood level. These included continuation of the Transform TO neighborhood engagement and the enhancement of Live Green Toronto to focus on deep energy savings in residential neighborhoods. However, we know from community engagement and technical analysis, as well as recommendations from the Transform TO advisory group, that neighborhoods are truly essential to reaching our long-term low carbon goals and are therefore proposing an acceleration campaign in this report too, focused on mobilizing low carbon neighborhoods. Through Transform TO's community engagement and modeling advisory group, we heard calls for ways for residents to participate in the city's low carbon plan within their own neighborhoods. We also heard that residents tend to feel at the neighborhood scale that they have the familiarity and agency needed to suggest and advance actions in line with the city's, in line with citywide low carbon goals. This acceleration campaign seeks to capture the significant resources represented within Toronto's diverse neighborhoods and to support residents in developing flexible, innovative, low carbon solutions that can help people within their own neighborhoods have an improved quality of life. Many low carbon actions can be considered at the neighborhood scale. For example, community energy planning looks at the efficient use of energy through local shared energy services, so district energy systems, thermal heating networks. As Toronto undertakes public transit and active transportation infrastructure build-outs, like improved sidewalks or bicycle lanes, there's an opportunity to work with local communities to maximize the usefulness as well as the use of these investments through programming, outreach, and engagement. The approach of mobilizing low-carbon neighborhoods also offers the opportunity to acknowledge that broad-based behavior change will be necessary to achieve the full benefits of the Transform TO strategy. And the best way to understand what might support those kinds of behavior change is to seek input and advice from communities about what makes sense in their particular neighborhoods. The objectives of the Mobilize Low Carbon Neighborhood Campaign include advancing best practices in neighborhood-based engagement, recognizing that engagement practices that make sense in one part of the city may need to look very different in another, cultivating local leaders who can support climate actions, identifying ways through community input as to how Transform TO climate actions could improve affordability and also support the city's poverty reduction and social development strategies. And specifically, explore how neighborhood scale transform TO initiatives could enhance community resilience. Looking at all of these objectives, there's the intent to take action with three to five quick start projects. Expanding mobility options and embracing electrification. As we saw earlier, there's a significant opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Toronto's transportation system. The Transform TO low carbon scenario demonstrates an annual potential reduction of over 3,000 kilotons from transit, active transportation infrastructure expansion, and the electrification of transportation and mobility. 
To reach the long-term goals, Toronto must follow through with planned investments in active transportation infrastructure as outlined in the 10-year cycle network plan, and also deliver on planned and approved public transit investments. In December 2016, City Council approved the following Transform TO Report 1 strategies around developing a low-carbon freight strategy to address in an integrated way urban freight movement and its impacts on congestion, business continuity, and especially air quality, as well as providing direction already to seek to enable electric vehicles. However, as the electrification of mobility, so the electrification of personal vehicles, public transit, and other transportation devices offers the greatest additional emission reduction potential within Tor Toronto's transportation system, TransformTO recommends a campaign to prepare Toronto for electric mobility. We know that converting our fleet of vehicles, our passenger freight and transit vehicles, from gasoline to electricity is a central element of the potential reductions modeled in the transform to a low carbon scenario. This conversion provides a significant reduction both of greenhouse gas emissions and of local air pollutants that negatively affect the health of Toronto residents. While there are significant benefits to shifting to electrification, it also presents challenges and opportunities to how electricity is managed within Toronto's grid. The key objectives of the Prepare for Electric Mobility campaign include co-developing an electric vehicle transition strategy for Toronto with key stakeholders, develop an electric vehicle charging infrastructure strategy, Identify best practices in electric vehicle preparedness to ensure equitable outcomes for all residents and that the electrification of mobility increases access to mobility while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air quality and air pollution. The objective would be to prioritize electric vehicle approaches that maximize community benefit and to launch quick start projects to test the implications of electrical vehicle use for the local grid while exploring how electric vehicles could enhance community resilience, potentially through acting as energy storage for distributed renewable energy generation. Over half of the greenhouse gas emissions in Toronto come from the operation of our residential and commercial buildings, primarily from the natural gas burned to heat our space and water. Increasing the energy performance of our existing buildings through retrofitting and ensuring that new ones are built to high standards is a primary focus of the Transform TO low carbon scenario and the recommended actions within the staff report. The Transform TO low carbon scenario demonstrates that efficiency gains in existing buildings and high performance requirements 4,000 kilotons of greenhouse gas emission reductions in the year 2050. Transform TO Report 1 presented a number of strategies to advance energy efficient and emission energy efficiency and emission reduction in building construction and retrofitting that will need to be implemented to achieve the identified potential GHG reductions. These include the continued development of the existing Toronto Green Standard that requires new construction to meet higher levels of energy performance than the Ontario Building Code. Toronto is already developing a zero emissions building framework. The details will be provided to Council in the fall of 2017, and it includes a global best practices review of leading energy codes and standards, and sets out an energy performance and greenhouse gas emission reduction pathway to 2030, with zero emission buildings for five building archetypes typically built in Toronto. Approved in December 2016 was also the enhancement of the Better Building Partnership to ramp up program delivery of energy efficiency retrofits in commercial and institutional buildings and support the construction of high performance new construction within these sectors. Similarly, support for residential property owners through programs including HELP, the Home Energy Loan Program and High rise for multi-unit residential buildings have on average to date delivered the kind of deep energy efficiency retrofits, up to 40% of energy savings, that were modeled as necessary in the transform TO low carbon scenario. 
That said, in addition to these approved short-term strategies, TransformTO has identified a significant opportunity to align workforce development programs with low-carbon building initiatives to further accelerate efficiency gains and emission savings in Toronto's building sector. TransformTO is therefore recommending the initiation of an acceleration campaign, Workforce Development for High Performance Buildings. The level of building sector activity required to achieve the 2050 target will drive major local employment, generating an estimated 80,000 person years of employment between now and 2050 through retrofit and high performance new construction activities. Retrofit activity is also synergistic with social housing renewal and can offer important health benefits to residents through improved indoor air quality. The key objectives of this campaign are to create a building energy performance strategy, both for building retrofitting, building recommissioning, and building operations. Identify priority approaches to drive community benefits with an early focus on social housing renewal. Develop a workforce strategy with stakeholder import with the goal of a highly skilled workforce to support high performance buildings while at the same time creating opportunities for employment for people who often face barriers to employment. And finally, improving the resilience of Toronto's building stock to extreme weather events and power disruptions. Adopting renewable and community energy approaches. By continuing to support distributed renewable energy generation capacity and the development of low carbon district energy systems while advancing policy and regulations for low carbon energy planning, Toronto can reach its 2050 target and achieve over 1,000 kilotons of greenhouse gas emission reductions potential that have been identified within the energy system of the low carbon scenario. In December 2016, City Council adopted three transform TO strategies to initiate energy system transportation, transformation, and they will need to be implemented to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions necessary to hit the 2050 long-term goal. Need to advance community energy planning, and there are already currently four planning studies underway where the city is investigating, in partnership with community members, the potential for those communities to be net zero. We're seeking to work to advance low carbon renewable thermal energy networks and in the summer of 2017, a report will be brought forward on the potential to design, build and deliver a large scale low carbon district energy system. And finally, City Council directed us to create a renewable energy strategy as the first step in realizing the renewable energy potential in Toronto by developing a citywide strategy for renewable energy technologies, including solar photovoltaics and geothermal. Apologies to everyone. I know there was a minor technical difficulty, but I think everything should be back in order. Uh, so, as I was mentioning, uh, the fifth urban system that would be transformed through the, oops, excuse me, the fifth urban system that would be transformed would be that of how we handle our solid waste. So, in July of 2016, City Council adopted a new long-term waste management strategy that puts a priority on reducing waste while minimizing the amount of waste sent to landfill. This long-term waste management strategy will guide waste management for the next 30 to 50 years and adopts an aspirational goal of zero waste generation, which is in line with the kind of transformation required to achieve Toronto's greenhouse gas emission reduction target. The acceleration campaign would include a waste diversion and waste minimization and seek to advance us towards the long-term goal proposed within the staff report of 95% waste diversion by the year 2050. In summary, across Toronto's urban systems to achieve the long-term goal, we must, as a community, implement the approved actions that Council has already committed to in relation to emission reductions. We must pick up the pace and implement the Report 1 strategies that were adopted by City Council in December of 2016. And in this report, we propose three acceleration campaigns to mobilize low-carbon neighborhoods 
prepare for electric mobility, and develop the workforce to realize high-performance buildings. Thank you very much, Linda. And thank you very much for everyone for listening. Uh, apologies again for the minor technical uh, interruption. Hopefully everyone is back online. Um, just a note very quickly on next steps. The Parks and Environment Committee will be meeting on Thursday, May 4th, to discuss the Transform TO Report Number 2. Following that, pending committee approval, City Council, it will be forwarded to City Council on May 24th. Um, just a note to keep your questions coming in. Uh, we've received a number already and we'll do our best to answer them as best we can. So again, uh, thank you, Linda, and thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, just a reminder that the best way to do it is to submit questions or comments through the WebEx Q&A function on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen or by tweeting at LiveGreenTO or at Atmospheric Fund with the hashtag TransformTO. Our TransformTO experts joining, joining us for the question period today are Linda Swanson, who you've heard from already, and Mark Beckering from the City of Toronto. We will do our best to answer, as I mentioned before, as many questions as we can, um, but we'll also post an FAQ on the TransformTO website following the webinars. If you have any further comments or questions, please don't he hesitate to email us email us at transform at toronto.ca. That is T-R-A-N-S form F-O-R-M at toronto.ca. So we're just going to take a moment to get all our questions organized and then we'll jump right into it. And the developer is interested in going further. We provide development charge rebates to incursion to at least a minimum of its one. The number of other things in the Toronto Green Standard, but from an energy efficiency perspective, those are the two things. We have things like our green roof bylaw. We also just recently worked very closely with the province of Ontario in the establishment of a mandatory energy reporting and benchmarking regulation, which comes into effect uh, actually this year. And the first round of reporting will start in the, in the middle of next year, 2018. And what that does is it requires the owners of buildings 50,000 square feet or larger to actually publicly disclose the amount of energy and water that they uh, are consuming in their buildings and allows us all to see which are the excellent performers, which are the poor performers, and uh, and then ideally you'll be able to work with those property owners on what things they can do to reduce their energy and water consumption. So there's just a few examples again of this uh, kind of the foundation of regulations and then I've already mentioned in my answer to the first question around the kind of incentive programs that we have in place to support people. But the key the thing that we're going to be doing is as we move forward in implementation and, and council um, hopefully endorses this and, and allocates the additional funding that was requested in report number one, is be able to do the research to ensure that we actually get that right mix of um, programs, incentives, and regulations. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we have a question here for Linda. Again, uh, apologies on the earlier technical issues with the audio. What we're going to do is uh, come back to the uh, questions Mark responded to, and we'll fill in any gaps that got missed when the audio dropped off. Thank you. Great. So a question that came in off the Twitter. Uh, which low-carbon actions have the most potential to drive community benefits, and how can this be achieved? Linda? Thank you, Stuart. So one of the key things of our findings was that it's not so much what we do, but how we do it that will determine the degree to which community benefit is realized. So in seeking to design and deliver greenhouse gas emission reduction actions and strategies, TransformTO has put delivering community benefit top of mind. That said, one of the tasks that we gave to our TransformTO modeling advisory group was to undertake a multi-criteria analysis of different approaches to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to identify where they felt the greatest potential for community benefit lay. So what you can see on the screen now is the outcomes of that multi-criteria analysis. So across the y-axis, you have a list of 12 different kinds of greenhouse gas emission reduction efforts, public transit investments, active transportation supports, 
land use and structural change, so the design and delivery of complete communities in vibrant neighborhoods as per the official plan, building energy efficiency retrofits, uh, TGS is the Toronto Green Standard, um, so on and so forth. And what you see in the colored horizontal bars is the types of community benefit that our modeling advisory group felt could best be achieved through those actions. So in the legend on the right-hand side, you can see public health benefit, clean air, so improved air quality, uh, increases in quality affordable housing, improved affordability generally, improved mobility, improved resilience, et cetera. So what this slide gives you, which is included in attachment A of the staff report, is our modeling advisory group's expert advice or opinion on where we might be able to achieve the greatest community benefits. And so here you can see that some of the public health and air quality benefits that they anticipate could be realized through transit and active transportation and community development, they feel has some of the greatest community benefit options. So what we've done in putting together the staff report is receive this advice. It's helped inform our recommendation around guiding principles for program delivery, and also has helped us identify in the three acceleration campaigns where we need to really be focusing our efforts to maximize community benefit. And in fact, the three acceleration campaigns themselves are designed really to ensure that the appropriate community-wide stakeholders are part of the process as we look to accelerate emissions reductions in these particular areas. And so you can see that the complete communities uh, mobilizing low-carbon neighborhoods really responds to land use and structural change as a key co-benefit area. Um, preparing for electric mobility, while electric vehicles themselves was one of the lower rated uh, co-benefit opportunities, that's why it's particularly important to ensure that as we prepare for electric mobility, co-benefits are top of mind. And then the building um, workforce development for high performance buildings would seek to realize the community co-benefits potential of building retrofits, the green standard, decentralized renewable energy, um, and district energy, which are also identified on this chart. Great. Thank you for such a detailed answer, Linda. Uh, another question here as it relates to transportation and transit. I believe, Mark, you're up. Since improved transit is a priority, will the city expedite the construction of pro pro proposed improvements? If yes, which ones? So in the modeling exercise, <coughs> we as um, Linda mentioned in her presentation, we did two scenarios. There was the business as plant scenario and then the low carbon scenario. So in the business as plant scenario, we incorporated all the existing planned and under construction um, rapid transit expansion that's occurring in the city of Toronto. So that includes things like the extension of the subway up to York University in the city of Vaughan, the uh, Eglinton Crosstown that's currently under construction, the, the now the the Scarborough subway extension, and a couple of our light rail transit projects. With respect to the low carbon scenario, the city has actually you know, mapped out a number of uh, rapid transit initiatives that are currently not funded, but definitely are on the books as planned initiatives to, to further expand the, the city's rapid transit systems. And I would encourage you to take a look at page um, 56, 57 of the Appendix B, and the consultant's report, or the full report of the consultant on, on the modeling exercise. Because in there, there's the summary of the, the 23 plus transit projects that are proposed and were then modeled into the low carbon scenario. We did not sort of stage them or, or make any assumptions about which ones would get built first, as I'm sure many people would appreciate. That is uh, something that still has to be sort of evaluated and discussed, but rather we did identify that we do need to work towards constructing all of them to achieve the low carbon future. Stuart? Thank you, Mark. Another question here. Um, this relates to electricity. Linda, I think she's going to take this one. How are you assuming this additional electricity will be generated? How, uh, how much GHGs are you assuming gener generating electricity will create? Uh, 
Thank you, Stuart. When the low carbon scenario was being generated, one of the first things we did was identify the need to prioritize efficiency over other efforts. So before looking at fuel switching or before looking at alternate um, types of fuel, so moving from natural gas to electricity for heating, for example, of, of homes, transform to modeling first sought to maximize the efficiency of the activity. So for example, in thinking about whether or not we'll have enough electricity going forward, as long as we continue to diversify our low carbon energy sources and focus on increasing building energy efficiency, we will be able to generate and have available to us adequate energy and electricity to meet the needs of the low carbon scenario. In the technical report, so attachment B, um, if you look on, uh, for those of you who are interested in diving into the details, if you look on page 73, there's actually a series of diagrams that demonstrate both the types of energy, their uses, and how much is wasted in both our 2011 baseline, our business as planned scenario, and the low carbon scenario. And what you'll see in looking at the low carbon scenario is that while certainly a greater percentage of energy used community-wide is electricity, the actual total amount of electricity required to power an efficient low carbon future is less than both in the business as planned and in the 2011 baseline. So really the key message here is that as long as efficiency is prioritized first, we will have the ability with distributed energy generation to meet the electricity needs of the projected or the modeled low carbon scenario in the year 2050. Great, thank you, Linda. And again, for folks who are looking to jump into the details, page 73 of the appendix. Uh, a question here for Mark. What about urban agriculture, urban forestry, and low energy landscaping? Does the action plan address the role of the natural environment, for example, trees, plants, soils, and their role in carbon sequestration. Thank you, Stuart. So I'm assuming that the, the individual asking this question is recognizing uh, that in this the strategy that's presented to Council, we actually don't make any recommendations around sort of those issues around, of tree planting or urban agriculture. Let me assure you, it's not because we don't think those are important issues or the, an important part of improving the quality of life and the environment in the City of Toronto. But the, and it did come up a lot in the public engagement that we uh, carried out and a large number of people did raise uh, an interest or recognize the need to accelerate and, and take better care of our natural environment, particularly our trees and natural areas and ravines and, and so on. Um, but when the context of the scope of this initiative, we, we decided to narrow the focus, or not narrow, but to keep the focus of the initiative on how we use energy in particular and um, and look for the opportunities to reduce the energy consumption consumed and with that the, the GHGs that are produced. So while trees, for example, play an, do play a very important role in terms of sequestering or absorbing greenhouse gas emissions, um, the, as I said, we really actually focused on how we actually reduce the generation of the emissions. Now that said, um, it's very important to note that the city does have other things in place that are working towards these issues of tree planting. And interestingly, at the same committee meeting on, on Thursday, there is a report, uh, another staff report also being presented to the Parks and Environment Committee that's proposing a, a $1 million uh, program to, to support um, private tree planting or encourage residents to do tree planting in, on their property. So I use that as an example that, you know, while we may not have addressed it specifically in the Transform TO initiative, it is something that the city is working towards through another other initiatives, both the tree planting and urban agriculture and so on. Thank you, Mark. Uh, another question here around the, uh, the GIS component of the work. Um, is the geospatial analysis conducted for Transform TO available to community groups to analyze local, e.g. neighborhood scale issues, uh, is there any support available for these groups who may not be technically proficient in using open data sets? Linda. 
Thanks, Stuart. Um, one of the things that we set out to do, and actually in the initial terms of reference for Transform TO, which at that time was called Transformation Toronto 2050, um, is a focus on open data. So certainly uh, all of the data that we have compiled and used to inform the low carbon modeling um, as much as possible will be provided through the City of Toronto's open data portal. Uh, and some of that will be geospatial. Um, and in terms of further discussion, uh, please do, uh, if this is your question, get in touch with the Transform TO team at transform at toronto.ca. Um, and we'd be happy to discuss this with you when we talk about mobilizing low carbon neighborhoods and those three to five quick start projects. Um, the effort there in part would be to take the citywide findings and the geospatial information we have available and, and make it relevant at the neighborhood scale. So um, please do get in touch and that is something we can talk about further. Great, thanks Linda. So again, if, if you do want to get in contact uh, with the Transform TO team, um, you can do it on Twitter or also via email at transform at toronto.ca. Another question for, for Linda here. Will the city maintain a list of companies that are competent in retrofitting buildings to zero emission performance? So again, thank you for the question. Um, it's not something that we have yet uh, developed or considered, but it's certainly something in terms of putting together a list of, of competent retrofitting companies uh, that we will look at as we're moving forward. And certainly one of the benefits of these kind of Q&A sessions is to help us identify what useful supports would be for folks uh, in helping to move forward with the approved and recommended strategies. So thank you for that insight. Thanks, Linda. Uh, another question as it relates to the short-term actions and, and implementation. Question from someone on Twitter, I believe. The first round of short-term actions was not funded by Council. What happens to Transform TO if implementation funding isn't approved? Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I used to work for, uh, I used to have a director and one of his favorite sayings was, um, no money, no program. Um, just a very short way of just saying that uh, obviously if um, City Council decides that they are not able to or are unwilling at this time to, to fund the initiatives, then we don't move forward. However, I think as I mentioned in some earlier question or answers to earlier questions, you know, a lot of what we proposed, particularly in the first report, was an acceleration and expansion of existing programs. So if we, the key thing here is if for some reason then the additional funding is not made available, at least initially, that we just don't work towards the expansion and acceleration of those programs. We still will obviously continue to deliver the programs that we have in place with the existing resources and funding that's available to us. So it doesn't end the program, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but rather it just would slow it down. Thank you, Mark. A question uh, as regards to a natural gas infrastructure. Um, Linda's going to take this one, I believe. How does natural gas infrastructure play a part in the low carbon plan? Thanks, Stuart. So, again, referring to, I guess, my seemingly my favorite page in the report. Um, on page 73 of the technical appendix, um, you see that in this particular low carbon scenario, uh, natural gas is still involved in the 2050 scenario. Um, in this particular scenario, we're using about a third of the natural gas uh, that we're using currently, uh, to, or compared to 2011. However, one of the differences is that the city is currently exploring ways for natural gas to be derived from renewable sources. So already we're looking at ways to harvest natural gas um, from our anaerobic digesters, so where all of um, residents' green bin organics are processed by solid waste. That's one potential source for renewable natural gas, um, as well as some other biogas opportunities associated with wastewater. 
Um, so really, again, the technical modeling was looking to identify what is uh, feasible or possible um, in a given scenario. And so in this scenario, we've identified this kind of opportunity to both reduce natural gas use significantly while simultaneously seeking out renewable sources for any remaining natural gas. Great. I think the favorite page will definitely be 73. Uh, another question here. Um, Mark, are you game for this one? Number 15. The most surprising goal I saw was making 75% of trips under five kilometers walking or biking. Does this involve significantly disincentivizing short distance public transit? So the short answer, no. <laughs> Um, in fact, what we propose is that there will be more support to increase the share of walkers and cycle, cyclists within that five kilometer range by shortening, shortening sorry, the length of trips to work and school and recreation so um, they'll be able to, so they'll be able to walk and cycle. Um, so that many, many trips in Toronto are done sort of within that 10 kilometer range and really our goal when we talk about Shifting things in the big picture is um, shifting a lot of those 10 kilometer trips to the low carbon choices and particularly obviously public transit. So I think, you know, definitely, I mean, uh, that more people walking and biking might have sort of a, a, a slight impact in reducing some of the short transit trips. The goal is to encourage people to use transit for their longer trips, you know, would more than uh, uh, suffice in terms of mitigating that, that reduced transit trips, transit oriented trips for short, short distances. Thank you, Mark. Um, recognizing the slight technical itches, um, glitches, I should say, not itches, we had at the beginning of the webinar, what I'm going to do is circle back to Mark on a uh, response to question one. It's a little bit of a Groundhog Day thing, but um, we're just going to read it out so everyone gets a sense of it. What are the new programs initiatives do you plan to introduce to encourage homeowners, builders, developers to improve their energy efficiency to close the 8.7 megaton gap? I say this because you mentioned that current efforts will only get you down to 14.1 megatons per year. What are the specific near-term plans to incentivize existing high-rise building owners to achieve 40% energy savings? Mark, you're up again. Hopefully I give the same answer I gave earlier. <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to mention is that uh, the City of Toronto has a solid foundation of programs already in place to, to encourage and support people in making energy retrofits to their buildings. We have things like a better building partnership where we provide professional advice and, uh, and financial support towards the retrofitting in large commercial buildings and industrial or institutional and industrial buildings. We have things like our high-rise program and our health program, which help um, residential property owners, both single detached or ground-related single-family housing and multi-residential housing, access low-interest long-term financing towards en deep energy retrofits. On the new construction, we have things like our Toronto Green Standard, where we work to incent and to some degree re require you know, energy performance and new construction that goes beyond the minimum in the Ontario Building Code. So that's the things that the City of Toronto has in place today. And then there's of course things that the province of Ontario and, and others uh, utilities have in place that we definitely link our programming to. And the province will most likely as part of its climate change plan be offering some additional supports and incentives. So that's a long-winded long answer to start with in the sense of trying to get people an understanding. We have a solid foundation. And in report number one that we presented to Council in December 2016, essentially what we proposed is action and funding to expand and accelerate and enhance a lot of these programs and also to identify potentially new initiatives or initial programs and incentives that we could offer. So the key thing is, the message here is, we recognize that we've got this foundation. The foundation, as the question mentions, won't get us to our goal for 2050, but with the uh, enhancements that we've proposed in report number one, we think we can start to accelerate those efforts and get us more on the trajectory to the 2050 goal. 
and the positive, I guess, is when the the first report was uh, adopted by council, they also um, provided funding towards um, four additional staff in the Environment and Energy Division to work on the Better Building Partnership. So we are already working towards the hiring of those four additional staff and getting them engaged in the initial work to start the acceleration process of that program. So we're on the right path, but definitely you know, we, we need to work on expanding and accelerating these initiatives and looking for the new opportunities. Thank you, Mark. We'll give you a moment to catch your breath, and then we've got you up for another Groundhog question, I'm afraid. So, another question uh, we're circling back to. Is there a plan for the city to introduce regulations, incentives, programs for the businesses and private sector of the city to also work towards these goals? Thank you, Stuart. Um, so, I won't repeat myself in terms of mentioning the, the existing programs that have in place. But um, I would add a little bit about some of the things that the city already has in place around sort of regulations as a foundation. So the Toronto Green Standard, which is, um, applies to new development, there are a number of elements to the Toronto Green Standard where we're trying to encourage environmental performance in the new construction that, uh, but in the relation to what we're talking about today. Tier 1 under the Toronto Green Standard is mandatory and it does require a performance of an energy performance that's 15% better than the minimum standard required in the building code. And then under Tier 2 of the Toronto Green Standard, we work to encourage developers to go to at least a 25% improvement in energy performance. And if they do achieve that, they would become eligible for some financial incentives through development charge rebates. Um, we have things like the green roof bylaw, where all new construction is required to include a green roof in its, um, in its new construction. And then more recently, we uh, worked very closely with the province of Ontario to develop the energy reporting and benchmarking regulation. So this is a province-wide regulation, but the what we'll, which is now in place and the first reporting starts in the middle of 2018. And the regulation essentially requires all owners of buildings that are 50,000 square feet and larger, so it's both residential, industrial, and commercial, to publicly disclose the amount of energy and water that they consume on an annual basis. And the positive of this is this is a regulation that will allow us to understand who are the, be who are the good performers, who are the bad performers, um, and look to design our programs in the sense of, you know, are there certain types of buildings that we should be focusing on because they're bad performing or certain areas of the city. Um, and and really help enhance a lot of the programs that I mentioned in terms of financial incentives and professional support that we can provide to building owners and property owners. So we have those things in place. Um, report number one, as I already mentioned in my earlier answer, is recommending additional action and resources to help sort of accelerate and expand upon these initiatives and do the research to identify are there other sort of additional regulations that we might want to consider over the next few years or, or potentially the next 35 years uh, and also you know what are all the opportunities to sort of expand and accelerate the, uh, the programs that are in place. Thanks Mark. You can take an extended break now. Uh, Linda's up next. Um, did the city take into account the limits on global cumulative emissions specified in the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC? Linda. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so the city uses, or in 2007, City Council unanimously adopted uh, a citywide emission reduction goal of 80% uh, by 2050 from 1990 levels. Uh, and that 80% reduction target is globally recognized um, as what would be needed to prevent temperature rises exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. Um, we recognize that there are there's always updating science and updating analysis about what the global carbon budget is um, and certainly uh, are aware and following those developments, uh, we continue to work towards council adopted goal um, of an 80% reduction as obviously for us given where we currently are um, and the amount of emission reductions that would be needed to reach that target, um, it's still something that will require bold action and a significant acceleration of pace and scale. 
Um, one addition in this report is that we are proposing that the City of Toronto start to investigate the applicability of consumption-based emissions reporting. Um, so currently we report um, around through a production-based inventory, so really look at the point source emissions within our geographic boundary. But uh, increasingly, cities are recognizing that though our greatest areas of influence tend to be point source production-based emissions, that uh, the carbon footprint, specifically of people in um, consuming cities or the global north, like Toronto, uh, can often be as, if not more, significant. So that has become a recommendation in the staff report that we investigate and report back um, around consumption-based emissions. Um, and also, I will not give you the page number, um, but we can tweet it to you later. Uh, there is a discussion of the carbon budget um, associated with the low carbon scenario in technical appendix B. Uh, it's towards the end of the appendix, um, and I will um, maybe we'll tweet out that page number later. Thanks, Linda. So, another question here. Um, what are some examples of successful low carbon actions achieved by other North American cities? Hashtag TransformCO. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so one of the things we'd like to mention is that the actual uh, actions that are modeled as part of the low carbon scenario were in part derived from a international best practice scan conducted by one of our consulting team partners, Arup. Um, so many of those actions and programs uh, were identified from cities that are implementing them around the world through the C40 Cities Network or the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. Um, so, for instance, we're looking also at uh, programs that haven't yet uh, been, um, may not have been modeled, but sort of identifying that, that kind of um, shift, targeted mode shift of 75% of short trips uh, being cycled or walked could require the kind of creative interventions we're seeing in places like Oslo, where uh, the municipal government is providing local families with a free electric cargo bike uh, to support their efforts. So um, we see for sure that there are all kinds of things happening internationally, and some of them are or are not appropriate in a city of Toronto context, um, but certainly looking especially to the long-term 2050 horizon staying appraised of the kind of innovations that are happening internationally um, is part of ensuring that the Transform Geo rollout is both as effective but also as appropriate for the City of Toronto as possible. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, a question here for Mark. Who are the stakeholders or who were the stakeholders within the modeling advisory group? How were they engaged throughout the process? Thank you, Stuart. Um, so the modeling advisory group uh, consisted of roughly 35 people, and um, there was a real mix. Our goal had been to to identify and bring to the to the table people from a variety of different sectors. So the, the mandated advisory group was not solely to just engage in advising on how to do the modeling or evaluate the technical aspects of the modeling. But rather, more importantly, we, we were looking for people to help uh, help us understand what might be some of the co-benefits and co-harms of the low-carbon actions that we were going to be modeling and suggesting as uh, one pathway or one direction we could take to achieve the 2050 goal. So some of the groups that were involved included the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, the... Sorry, apologize, I just uh, lost my listing of uh, organizations here. The, uh, the Social Planning Council, the Ryerson University Cities Institute, the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, the Youth Cabinet, Toronto Youth Cabinet, uh, the Toronto Environmental Alliance. So you get a sense that you know we were looking to engage people from sort of the broader finance sector, from the social and health sectors, um, and of course some of the environmental groups. So we had that blending of discussions. The way the people were engaged, um, there was a series of um, meetings that we went through with the group. There were a total of four, if I remember correctly. I'm sure it's discussed in the report in greater detail. But uh, the the members went through a very rigorous exercise, and you know we really appreciate the time they put into it. It was all voluntary, and as I said, it was four meetings. Um, three of them were half day. One was a whole day meeting. 
where they worked with our consultant and through went through different exercises that the consultants had designed for us to help us really build that kind of broad consensus and understanding of the different relationships between low carbon action and helping achieve some of our goals around poverty reduction, job creation, economic prosperity, improving public or community health and so on. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, given that we did have a few technical qu uh, technical issues at the beginning of the Q&A session, we're going to extend the webinar for another additional 10 minutes. So at 1.30, we're not going to uh, we're not going to switch down the, the webinar. We're going to keep it going until uh, 1.40. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in that time, and we will follow up with any unanswered questions in the FAQ. So the next question is up for Linda. It was noted that some actions, in, with respect to some actions, the ROI or return investment relates to unavoided cost of carbon. What is the base carbon price assumed when performing these calculations? Linda. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so first of all, just to clarify, when we talk about a positive return on investment, um, we're just talking about avoided energy cost savings. Um, so while there were some calculations uh, connected to the social cost of carbon, uh, which does include um, which does include a price on carbon. When we talk about up to two thirds of the modeled actions having a positive return on investment, that's just from energy savings. Um, also, it doesn't include avoided costs like uh, reduced healthcare spending um, or the kind of avoided costs that we're starting to be able to quantify around improved quality of life um, and general, uh, I guess, life satisfaction. So um, that positive return on investment is one which could be demonstrated for many of the modeled actions in a business case um, and wouldn't depend on quantifying avoided costs beyond those related to energy savings. Great. Thank you, Linda. So a couple of questions here for Mark. Okay. Clean powering EVs depends on the ability to draw low carbon power from the grid. Will the city work with uh, Toronto Hydro, utilities, and the province to ensure the grid energy mix keeps getting greener? Mark? Um, so the short answer, of course, it, you know, is yes. I mean, we have to uh, work with our utility partners and um, in the province of Ontario, this is not something the city of Toronto just on its own can achieve. Um, it's something that requires action by by everybody, essentially. So we do recognize the need to, to, to work with the electrical utility to ensure that the, the grid has the ability to deliver the electricity that's necessary and can manage the kind of transformational change that's a, that is being proposed in this report. Similarly, uh, the natural gas utility would be the same kind of discussion with them and, and as to be honest, and has started with both of those utilities. The province of Ontario is very much aware of what we're doing as we are them and we can continue to meet with them and we'll continue those discussions and where the synergies and the opportunities are to, 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 to work together. Um, I think, you know, things I would add to sort of go beyond what the question is asking, um, as Linda mentioned, you know, the modeling does show that the electricity demand is, does 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 drop and uh, if we achieve the low carbon scenario so that will help a lot with our ability to sort of make sure we have the capacity to support the transformational change. And then there's a, a, a big element in this project is about low carbon thermal networks and uh, the work that we can take as a city to encourage the establishment of low carbon thermal district energy systems within the city which would then also enhance our resilience and therefore and reduce our reliance on kind of the larger um, larger electric, electric and natural gas systems that are, that are province-wide. And just for people's information, in, in June of this year, there will be a report going to the executive committee that's going to start the process and, uh, and discussion of how we can, as a city, move forward on establishing more um, low-carbon thermal and district energy systems within Toronto. Thank you, Mark. And I think your response is a good segue to a question we got from Twitter. 
Um, how will city resilience be increased through Transform TO? So uh, a low carbon city is a resilient city is, is a message that we consistently uh, sort of put out there and that you know, as I already mentioned in my answer before, you know, if we can reduce our energy demand and, 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 and reliance upon sort of the larger systems, then we become less susceptible to sort of breaks and, and failures in those systems. So definitely the, the actions that we're proposing in, in Transform TO are things that definitely will build up the resilience of our city to extreme weather and our broader resilience in the sense that um, you know, some of the key stresses that affect our ability to re sort of respond to extreme weather events or any, some other kind of shock um, are actually being talked about in this report. So for example, um, employment and, um, and the income, growing income disparity is one of the major stresses in our city that exists today, um, as is discussed in, this, in the report and talked about under one of the campaigns, the, the ability if we are successful in doing the aggressive kind of retrofitting and constructing low emission new buildings that we've talked about, the consultant has identified that that could generate in the range of 80,000 new jobs over the next 30 years. That obviously can help a lot to sort of address income of the, the, that one key stress in our community around employment opportunities and, um, and, and, and reducing sort of the inequality by reducing energy, energy bills and, and tied to housing affordability. So there is definitely a strong synergy between this initiative and the effort that we've uh, been initiating through this office in the city as a whole to improve our, our resilience in the city. And you'll probably notice also in one of the recommendations uh, that we propose in the staff report that the outcomes of Transform TO will be provided to the Chief Resilience Officer who is in the, the city is in the process of hiring right now and that will be integrated in or should be integrated into the work of the, of the Chief Resilience Officer. Thank you, Mark. Uh, a couple of questions for Linda here. How was the time period for the two-year um, key performance indicators reporting determined? Was annual reporting considered? Thank you. Um, so one of the things in uh, proposing a reporting framework, well, there were a number of factors we considered in proposing a reporting framework. Um, one was the amount of resources required to undertake and prepare the reporting. Um, and the second was the uh, rapidity with which the indicators were likely to move. Um, so one of the things we know is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions citywide uh, the variability year to year um, both is not significant and also um, can be affected within a given year quite significantly by things like the weather. So if you have a particularly cold winter, you may see in our currently predominantly natural gas powered heating system an uptick in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what we're really looking for around emissions reporting are kind of trend lines. So that's why um, the greenhouse gas emission reporting um, KPI is suggested on a, a two-year interval. Um, and similarly, we felt that a number of the other KPIs uh, were best reported out um, in terms of recognizing that the efforts to advance those KPIs uh, would be uh, best delivered, basically that the effort spent to report might be better used advancing progress against those KPIs. So that was how the two-year reporting framework um, was decided to be proposed. Great. Um, a question here as it relates to uh, one of the big energy users within the city, uh, pumping water. Uh, was the energy used uh, to pump water assessed through the study? Thanks, Stuart. Um, so, no, we didn't explicitly analyze. Um, we didn't say, okay, of all the water that is pumped, what percentage is used to water lawns, and therefore, by extension, um, given the amount of electricity required to pump water, what is the the electricity used, and therefore, the emissions associated with lawn watering. Um, that said, uh, while pumping water is a significant portion of the electricity used within the City of Toronto Corporation, uh, community-wide, um, we know that it, that's it's not as significant. So um, certainly it is captured within the overall uh, analysis of electricity use within the city. Great. 
Thank you, Linda. A couple more questions here. Okay. Um, this relates to air travel. Are there any implications to air travel, for air travel? Um, so air travel, of course, does generate a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's not not a, a something that we um, or is something that we acknowledge and, uh, and understand. However, in, within the scope of what we're doing right now, we have not actually included emissions from air travel. Um, it's part of we're we're using the the model or sorry the standard that's used for all municipalities, which focuses on um, our scope one and scope two emissions. Air travel is right now considered part of the scope three emissions. However, um, as Linda I think mentioned earlier, uh, we make we recognize the need to actually broaden our thinking about where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from and look at the total scope of, uh, uh, of emissions. And it's something that you know, will most likely be addressed as we move towards identifying how can we effectively sort of measure and, and model scope three emissions. And then from that, figure out what kind of initiatives and support we can provide to people to, to reduce their emissions associated with sort of consumption or, or per, yeah, uh, the scope three area. Okay. Thank you, Mark. A uh, question for Linda here. If in the future the C40 and the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliances move toward a 1.5 degree temperature rise limitation target rather than the 2 degree limit, are there any milestones for re-evaluation, readjustment built into the proposed Transform TO project structure? Thanks, Stuart. Um, so speaking before um, about the every two year key performance indicator reporting, but also proposed in the staff report are every four years, um, there would be a broader progress report um, and in my, the opportunity to uh, course correct or produce new recommendations around the next four year implementation plan. Um, so certainly uh, there is that continuous review and uh, regular opportunities to revise and enhance the program. Um, so as we move forward, there certainly would be the opportunity if evidence suggested it was appropriate to re-examine some of the implementation or goals set um, for that to happen. Thanks, Linda. Uh, we're nearing uh, the end of the time that we have available, but we're going to try to get maybe one or two uh, final questions in before the end of the session. Uh, question here for Mark. Were the interim KPIs or key performance indicators developed for the long-term goals? Are the KPIs outlined in one of the report's documents? So the short answer is no. We don't have the, the KPIs developed just yet. Um, but as you recognize, or people can recognize from the staff report, you know, we are proposing that there will be biannual reporting back to council on the uh, the outcomes and implementation of the strategy, you know, starting with uh, 2019. And recommendation number seven is where we outline sort of the monitoring and reporting back to council. And in that recommendation, we recognize that we do need to, before we start that reporting, actually figure out and develop sort of key performance indicators tied to a number of things. Um, one is an obvious one, sort of trying to track and measure the greenhouse gas emissions and reporting out on where we're at on a, a biannual basis. But we also want to develop some indicators around, you know, what kind of co-benefits are being derived with the actions that are being implemented as part of this strategy. Um, we want to try and track and measure and report back on the level of engagement, you know, to, to what extent are people actually taking up on the programs and policies that are being proposed. Um, are we seeing people getting actively engaged and taking action within their neighborhoods? So we, we were looking to develop some key, for, key performance indicators around that. Um, we're also thinking that it would probably be appropriate for us to report back in, on the kind of investment that's being made. And um, as we present in the report, the kind of level, the investment that's required to achieve this is very much a community-wide capital investment. It's not something that the City of Toronto, as a, as a corporation or, or um, as a government, that has to spend or is going to be spending money on. 
or rather the, the goals of, or the way we've presented things is that our work is to try and facilitate and, and encourage and, and support people in making the kind of investments that are necessary and achieving the returns that come with that, both in reduced greenhouse gas emissions and financial savings. So we're also going to be looking to see if there's a way that we can kind of track the level of investment that's occurring across the community and to, to achieve the goals that are outlined in Transform TO. So the short answer is no, we don't have those KPIs, but we recognize that we do definitely need to develop them and we will be working towards the development of them in time for the first report back to Council and implementation. Great. Thank you, Mark. I, I think that's a sort of great segue to our most likely final question of the day. Um, it builds on that to a certain degree. Is the Environment and Energy Division the, the division responsible for reporting and leading the implementation of the plan's action? Thanks, Stuart, and thanks for the question. Um, so in the City of Toronto uh, strategic actions document that was received by Council, um, which charts out the strategic actions and priorities for the entire City of Toronto Corporation from 2013 to 2018, um, the Environment and Energy Division is identified as the lead uh, for environmental sustainability work within the city. That said, within the Transform TO project, certainly this is a cross-corporate and community-wide initiative. And in the package of Report 1 strategies that City Council has already approved, for each of those strategies, there is an identified lead city division. Um, so you can go um, either to the clerk's page, uh, the city clerk's page, or to the Transform TO webpage. Um, and under the Reports and Documents tab, um, there are links to all of the reports received by City Council associated with Transform TO Report 1. Um, and in there, in the, the business cases attachments, you can see for each of those strategies which the lead division is. And certainly the Environment and Energy Division um, is a lead division on many of them, um, but many of our partners across the city are also critical um, and in certain instances are going to be leading the implementation uh, of these different areas because certainly while um, environment and energy may be the sustainability lead, uh, it is truly a community and corporate-wide effort that will be required to reach the long-term low-carbon goals. Um, so if the implementation is community and corporate-wide, the reporting, though, uh, will fall primarily to the Environment and Energy Division. So certainly when we talk about those KPIs um, or those four-year progress reports and implementation plan updates, the lead on preparing those with the input and involvement of the community and different divisions across the city, the lead for that uh, reporting effort will certainly be the Environment and Energy Division. Thank you, Linda, and I think that will be the last word today with respect to the questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for your time today over the lunch hour. Uh, thank you also to the partners and organizers of the webinar. Uh, we want to thank you for your patience as we sort of resolve those uh, audio issues, and we really appreciate all the questions that came in. Uh, the webinar will be posted on the Transform uh, TO webpage in the next few days, so watch for that. If you would like us to sign up for the Transform TO newsletter and updates or keep in touch, please visit our website at toronto.ca forward slash transformto or follow for more and up-to-date details with the hashtag transformto. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.